Um, welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, seminar. It's co sponsored by the Center for Peace and Development, Security and Context, and the Department of Economics at Colorado State University. I'm Rama Vasudevan uh, from Colorado State University. And it is a great pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, Professor Jayati Ghosh. She's currently at UMass Amherst, but before that, she taught economics at JNU for many years and has been a pillar of that distinctive economics department. I should know, I had the privilege of joining that department as a master's student just about the time Jayati came to JNU, fresh from Cambridge. Uh, she has been a really important influence in my own academic journey, making it even more of a pleasure to welcome her. Jayati has authored more than 200 articles and edited, authored about 20 books. The most recent, three books in a year, um, the last year, uh, The Making of a Catastrophe, COVID-19 and the Indian Economy, When Governments Failed, COVID-19 and the Economy, and Women Workers in the Informal Economy. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I can't do justice to the breadth of her work in this introduction. Her research has engaged critically with a range of issues that are of pressing relevance to development and developing countries. She's won many awards, the Adish Seshia Award for Distinguished Contributions to the Social Sciences in India, the Internet ILO Decent Work Research Prize, the North Sud Prize for Social Sciences, among others. But even more important and going beyond the confines of academia, she has been a tireless public intellectual talking, writing and engaging in policy work and advising both within India and internationally, including at the UN and ILO. Uh, her talk today is on climate responsibility and industrialization, the new Asian dilemma. I'm sure there's going to be a really stimulating discussion. The questions Please type uh, type in the Q and A uh, at the at the bottom of your screens. We'll take most of the questions at the end. We'll have time at the end for discussion. And if there's any clarificatory question, I might kind of uh, take it up earlier. But let me turn it over to Jayanti. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Rama. It's great to be in touch with you, even virtually. And uh, it's really a pleasure to come back and, and uh, interact with some of our brighter students. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. And thank you, Firat, also for inviting me. And without wasting any more time, I'm going to actually start sharing my screen. Let me just begin by giving you the background, which is that usually now in the uh, discussions on climate change, it's really seen, uh, of course, it's become extremely polarized between the North and South, but it's also one where there are genuine concerns in the South, that if you seek to do the climate change mitigation activities that are being uh, you know, seen as essential, then you are losing your chance for development. You are not going to be able to electrify everything. You're not going to be able to provide your own population basic needs and services. You're not going to be able to grow and get higher value added for your activities. In other words, you're kind of condemned simply because you have to bear your share of climate responsibility. And that brings into question this whole issue about how exactly do we assign climate responsibility? And it's when you think about it, if somebody had come down from Mars and said, well, you know, what is all this problem that you're all worried about right now? They would be amazed that something that is universally recognized to be a global problem, a global challenge, and something that affects everybody no matter where they are, it is nevertheless still sought to be addressed nationally. Even the negotiations, even the commitments, they're all national. Nobody is actually... Uh, thinking about how we can do this in terms of a global public investment framework, for example, in which we could actually um, just go ahead and make uh, global investments that are necessary, do global regulations to ensure that less carbon is emitted globally. That doesn't happen. Instead, every country goes out there and makes commitments. Now, how, on what basis is that? Well, countries in the negotiations are assigned climate responsibility based on your national carbon emissions. And these are what form the basis of the uh, negotiations and the commitments to control them. So you promise in 20 years, I will do this, in 30 years, I will do that. The most recent example, of course, Glasgow at COP26. 
where countries came and said, well, we are going to reduce, we're going to move to zero carbon. That was, of course, the catchphrase of Glasgow. We will move to zero carbon by so-and-so date. Somebody said 2050, somebody said 2030. Well, nobody actually said 2030, 2040. Some, somebody said 2070. But you make these broad commitments, which are conveniently in the future. And you say, well, I, in my country, commit to reducing the carbon emissions by this much. What's wrong with this? Well, first of all, of course, it completely ignores the historic responsibility of some countries. The reason we have a climate change problem today is because there is a huge tendency over time for more and more greenhouse gas emissions, which have exploded in the last 200 years and particularly in the last 50 years. And a large part of this is the result of activities in a very few countries, in countries that account for about 14% of the global population. But if you don't look at that, if you don't look at what you could call the carbon debt, then you're really understating the responsibility of richer countries. And so that's one huge problem with the negotiations. Another problem is that the assessment is usually made in terms of what are called purchasing power parity exchange rates. Now, what on earth is that? It's a, it's a whole long story, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, let me just explain that there is a, a tendency that emerged from about the 1990s onwards, not to look at the market exchange rates, that is the exchange rates that are actually prevailing, that everybody uses, uh, in terms of comparing incomes across countries, but to look at the purchasing power parity measure, which is supposed to estimate how much that currency can actually buy in that country. So for example, a dollar in the US will buy a lot less than 75 rupees in India, okay, for sure. And therefore it's argued that we shouldn't be looking at the Indian GDP in terms of the market exchange rate. We should be looking at it in terms of the purchasing power parity exchange rate, which is much, much higher. In other words, a dollar equals 75 rupees would translate much more into a dollar equals 20 rupees in India which is significantly different. It makes India a lot richer, right? And so this is the measure that is used when we compare across countries in these negotiations, whether at the WTO or in the COP. And as you can see, this really overstates the incomes of poor countries. I could give you a whole new lecture just on that because I really feel very strongly about this. But the basic, the bottom line is the reason that the exchange rate at PPP terms is so much higher in a country like India is because we have many more poor people who work for really low wages and absolute pittance. That's why that 75 rupees can command more than a dollar in the US. And so what you're really doing is it's a kind of double whammy. You're saying you're poor, but you're not as poor as you think you are because you're getting all this really cheap work labor from very, very impoverished workers. There's, there's a fundamental concern there. But then there's another concern, which is that when you're looking at these national emissions, you're looking really only at what are produced within your domestic boundaries. So you're not looking at how much you're consuming and how much emissions the production of what you're consuming creates. And what, why is that wrong? Because it underplays the continued significance of consumption in the North. So ever since this became an issue, a lot of the, what the North did was really to kind of export its emissions. It relocated a lot of production to developing countries, China, India, some Latin American countries and so on. And typically those were the more carbon emitting types of production. So you could be all clean and green internally while benefiting the, from the consumption of goods that were produced in not such a clean way. And then you use all of this to say, well, look, there's these massive increases in carbon emissions in China and India, shame on them, and they have to reduce and look at them, they're not reducing enough, et cetera. Okay, this is really how this is playing out. So let's just look a little bit more in detail at these methods of determining carbon emissions. The uh, production-based emission, that's really what's used. That's what the UNFCCC, that is the, the UN body that is tasked with uh, looking at climate change, that's what they use. So this means that you place the responsibility for the emission uh, on the production of goods and services within that location. It can be a, a, an area, a locality, a state, a nation, or even a whole region. 
but it covers all the production, whatever point in the value chain of any product, it, you, you cover that production, okay? And this obviously doesn't concern, consider the impact of cross-border trade, for example. So as you can see, and as I've already told you, it has a limitation. It doesn't account for the fact that in the rich countries, they're consuming a lot more emissions in terms of uh, having outsourced it to other countries than they're actually uh, producing themselves. And then there's extraction-based emissions. Now, what does this do? This tries to look at all the extracted natural resources, uh, typically the fossil fuels, you know, coal, oil, petroleum, et cetera, et cetera, because these are the most emitting activities. And then you allocate the responsibility to, to those who are extracting the resource. So you consider the downstream emissions also, which are enabled by the sale of that resource. In other words, you're looking at the extraction of a particular fossil fuel, and you're looking through the entire value chain to see who's involved, and then you allocate the responsibility for the emissions accordingly. You could also do value added emissions. That's much more complicated to actually estimate, but there are those who have bravely tried it. So you look at the share of value in any product and you look at the life cycle of that product, each step of the value chain, and you allocate the emissions accordingly. So if there is an Apple iPhone and then a you know, significant part of it is produced in a certain country, then, well, in China, then you can say, well, that much is accruing in China. But actually the value added in China of the iPhone is relatively small. The production is significant in China, the value added is relatively small. And a lot of that value added actually accrues to the US because it man the US, Apple manages to absorb it either through the uh, patents in the design or through all the uh, advantages it has in marketing. So then in fact, the US would be bearing a greater share of the responsibility of the emissions for that product. And then there are the more straightforward consumption-based emissions, which is what is it that you are emitting by virtue of satisfying your own domestic demand, both consumption and investment. And so the life cycle emissions are then allocated not across the value chain, but just to the final consumers. In the US, you consume so much worth of emissions through your consumption and your investment, even if your production emissions are significantly lower. And I would argue that that's probably the most useful way of looking at it right now, because that's really where it's at in a way, if, you're, if you do have to think nationally. So if we look at it, well, let's first also then bring back the whole issue about the carbon debt. I, I think I told you that there is a significant carbon debt by a few rich countries. And as you can see from this chart, this is an estimation of a, a global cumulative carbon emissions for a very long period, right? More than one and a half centuries from 1850 to 2011. And, uh, as you can see, United States, one fifth of global emissions, okay? European Union, 40% of global emissions. So just these two, 62% uh, of global emissions over this one and a half centuries, even though they account for about 12% of global population, okay? So that's a big, big chunk of the responsibility right there. Now you could argue that, hey, wait a minute, nobody knew about all this carbon stuff. Nobody even knew greenhouse gases were a problem. Why, why are you blaming past generations for something that no one was aware of? Fair enough. But then think in the most of this, more than half of these historical emissions occurred just in the last 30 years. And people have known about greenhouse gases. People have known about global warming over the last 30 years. Climate mitigation has been a thing over the last 30 years. People have known that there are strategies for it. So even if you say, well, we don't blame you for whatever happened that, you know, in the 19th century, you can certainly say that you have borne more than your fair share of global emissions over the last 30 years in a period when it was well known that this is a problem. Okay, now let's just look today at the largest emitters in the world in terms of production. And as you can see, China overtook the US, so I think about three years ago, and China is now the world's largest emitter. But it's interesting, as you can see, that um, 
the change is very, very dramatic for China, as you can see. It's more than tripled its emissions. It's increased in the US, but not by as much. Okay. It has actually um, not really increased that much for in uh, it. I mean, it had it has it has more than doubled in India, but it's still well below the Chinese levels. I and mean, then you can see that there are uh, increases in these other countries. Now, why have I taken this set of countries? Because together they account for about 80, 85 percent of global carbon emissions. Just a few countries. Think of that. Just these few countries accounting for so much of global carbon emissions. Okay, but if you look at per capita, then it doesn't look like China is so bad at all. Look at China, it is seven metric tons per capita in 2019, okay? Whereas the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Australia are way ahead of the pack, okay? In terms of the per capita carbon emissions. This is all in production terms here. India, very, very low, only two metric tons per capita, like Indonesia and Brazil, okay, significantly lower than many other countries. So as you can see, the producers of petroleum, basically, you know, uh, fossil fuel producers are likely to have much higher emissions, but they're not the only ones. So Russia and Saudi Arabia, you can explain because they have, they are producers of fossil fuels. Um, Australia also has a very major mining industry, but then you get other outliers, if you like, like Republic of Korea, which is an industrial country effectively, but and doesn't have any raw materials or fossil fuel industry, and nonetheless has very large emissions relative to a lot of other countries. But, and this is the point I was making, that you know international trade plays a very big role in driving actual emissions. So let's compare production versus final demand. And this refer, refers to 2015. This is absolute numbers of million metric tons. And as you can see, uh, the balance, the gray thing here is the balance. If you just want to make life simpler for yourselves, the US has the biggest balance, okay? It's 770 million metric tons in 2015. This is down from about double that amount in 2005. So they actually reduced that imbalance. They were exporting massively in terms of exporting the carbon emitting industries, if you like. Uh, they've reduced it somewhat, but they still remain by far the country with the greatest global imbalance. Most of the industrial countries actually have this negative balance. That is to say, they consume a lot more of carbon emitting goods than they produce themselves. And the reason for that, of course, very straightforward is China, which has a very large, significant positive balance. As you can see, its uh, production emissions are large. Its consumption emissions are not that large. I mean, they're large, but they're not as large as the production emissions, okay? And so it is actually that positive balance, which is paying for all of these countries, all the Italy, Germany, France, UK, Japan, US, et cetera. And uh, all of these other countries, actually, even Russia, which is seen as a very large emitter, they all have, in that sense, positive balance. That is, they are bearing the burden of other countries' consumption. Okay. Now, let's look at per capita emissions by final demand. And now we get an even more uh, strong picture of difference. So if you're looking at per capita emissions by final demand, the US is way ahead of the pack. The others are not even close. Well, Saudi Arabia is nowhere near, okay? The US is 18.1 metric tons per, per person in 2015. The closest competitor, if you like, is Japan with 10.6. But India, is it's only 1.5 metric tons per capita emission, which is nothing, right? And yet India is being held as this, you know, terrible country that's not even meeting its commitments and COP26 and how dare it say that it will continue emitting and so on and so forth. So there's this huge difference that emerges once you recognize. However, we have to also recognize that there's a lot of inequality within countries. In other words, it's not the case that it's one, I, I mean, I'm sure all of you know, these are not homogenous countries. There is massive and increasing economic inequality. But what's very interesting now is that it, there is also a lot of 
emissions inequality. So these data are from the World Inequality Report. There's some excellent work done by Luca Chancel, who is uh, one of the co-directors of the World Inequality Lab in Paris, along with Thomas Piketty. And uh, they have produced this very interesting estimate of emissions by population. And that actually, to me, was extremely insightful. So these numbers are in metric tons per capita. And so here we were saying, if I just want to go back a little bit and show you the average numbers. So for the US, it's 18.1 is the average. For India, it's 1.5 is the average, okay? That's the range, but you get the, the difference, but that's the average. Now let's look at North America. This is not the US, it's North America. So that 18.1 number comes from what? Well, the poorest half of the North American population is not produce, is not emitting that much. It's about less than 10 metric tons per capita. Whereas the richest top percent, it's 73 metric tons per capita, 73 per person, which is crazy. Now, if I had gone to the top 1% or the top 0.1%, I would have got explosive figures because you, you only have to think of Elon Musk and others traveling out in their little spaceships for joyrides to get a sense of the kinds of emissions that are available. But, and this is what is worth noting, it's not just in rich countries that there's this inequality. Look at East Asia, China, et cetera. The richest 10%, it's nearly 40 metric tons. And the bottom half, it's only three metric tons. Okay, uh, South and Southeast Asia, uh, the bottom here is showing more. Sorry, it should be two point. These numbers have got reversed. My apologies. It's 2.5 and 12 and 10.6. But that's the whole of South and Southeast Asia. And the reason we have this is because Southeast Asia is much richer in terms of uh, middle class that is able to actually produce, uh, emit more, if you like. But as you can see, the richest groups in the poorest regions are emitting more than the poorest groups in the richest regions. So the top 10% in South and Southeast Asia with 10.6, that's more than three times what the poorest in, uh, sorry, that's more, that's more than double what the poorest in Europe, the poorest half of the population in Europe are emitting. So there is a lot of internal inequality. And so one of the points I'm making is we can't really address the issue of global warming, climate change, climate mitigation, without addressing inequality. And that inequality is both global, international, and within countries. That you really have to do something about the consumption of the rich, of the elites. And yes, the, the North American rich are still the most obscenely emitting of anywhere else in the world. But the rich of East Asia, the rich of Russia, the rich of Middle East and North Africa are not doing too badly either. And are pretty much out there in terms of adding to the problems of global carbon emissions. So let's try and just break this down a little bit. I, I'm not sure how many of you are economic students, so this might be a little tedious for you, but um, consider this, how does a country reduce its emissions if it's production, uh, specific production? One of the biggest is through the reduction in energy use per unit of income. Okay, and usually do that by changing the sectoral composition of the economy. That is, you move from very uh, emitting kinds of activities, some kinds of agriculture, a lot of industry, and you move to services that use a lot less. Uh, when I say services typically use a lot less, not all of them use a lot less. Bitcoin uses a lot of energy, for example. But um, typically, that's the kind of change that reduces your energy use per unit of GDP or national income. But then you could also have technological changes within sectors, and these reduce energy consumption per unit of output. These are technology changes which make you more efficient. You can do something with less energy input. And then you can also change the kind of energy you're using. You can move from the worst kind, which is coal, to the next worst kind, which is petroleum, the next worst kind, which is natural gas, to well, nuclear, except that nuclear has all kinds of other issues, and ideally solar or wind energy. You could actually think of ways of using less carbon emitting sources, even in, if you're not changing how much energy you're using. Okay, 
I have some calculations uh, here. I should add that this is all work done jointly by with my colleague Shobhik Chakravarti at UMass and uh, two research students, uh, Anwar and uh, Adrina, who also participated in this research. But basically, we've done these calculations of how you can actually break it up in terms of this is the absolute uh, way in which the energy intensity, that is how much energy are you using relative to GDP, how much emissions are involved in that energy, okay? And what do we find? We find that in terms of the reduction, the big, it, it's quite interesting to see how these reductions have varied across countries and across the world as a whole. There's a biggest reduction has come really from the reduction in the energy intensity, as you can see, 13% reduction in the period between 2000 and 2018. And uh, most of that is because of the reduction in, the inten in uh, how in how intensively GDP requires energy at all, which can be sectoral change or it could be technological change. Okay. And within that, the best performers are a little surprising. The United Kingdom, Russia, and China, okay, are the best performers in terms of reducing energy intensity, which tells you that they have been actively either using technology or that they have been undergoing structural changes, sectoral uh, changes in the economy, which reduce the need to use energy for the economic activity. Every country has done significant sectoral changes, but in terms of the, kind, the emissions for the energy that you're using, some countries haven't done so well. There's a reduction for the world as a whole, but not a big reduction, a relatively small reduction. But Japan is actually using more energy, okay? The India is using more energy uh, more emitting, sorry, more carbon emitting energy. Both Japan and India have worsened the, the composition of their energy sources in a way that has actually worsened this, this particular uh, variable. You're not moving from the worst quality to the best quality, you're actually deteriorating your sources of energy. And other than for really the US, China, France, and uh, Italy, the, the rest are rather small, and, and the UK, I'm sorry, the rest are rather small in terms of reducing the shift to cleaner sources of energy. But remember that there's a wide variation in mitigation strategies. And as we've seen from looking at the fact that India and Japan were on the same page for some of these, per capita income is only one factor. So most countries have shown substantial declines in energy intensity both structurally and technologically. And it's kind of obvious that poor countries will have higher levels of absolute levels of emission intensity, uh, along with those who rely on oil exports like Russia. Now we've saw that India had the lowest levels and has continued to have the lowest levels of both per capita emission, emissions and per capita income in this group, okay? Uh, so when it's using relatively excess energy relative to GDP, it still comes to much less because of the fact that it is absolutely poor and it has a very low level of absolute per capita emissions. But the decline varies hugely, 13% in Italy to 40% in the UK. And it happened, as I said, through a combination of this decline in the, the, in the change in the sectoral uh, composition, but also reducing the share of more carbon emitting energy sources. So France, UK, Italy, USA, they all did that. But Japan and India increased their reliance on brown, on coal and on hydrocarbon, on, uh, uh, on petroleum. Why isn't more of this happening? Well, a big reason why this is not happening is because there's insufficient access to the frontline technologies for energy saving and energy using kinds of production because of the global IPR, the intellectual property rights regime, uh, which basically gives companies, mostly large multinational companies, control over knowledge and allows them to restrict access to knowledge and technology. And the rich countries have generally gone along with this. They have resisted technology transfer 
which is when you think about it as a global problem, it's a real tragedy of the commons, right? It's very stupid because it's counterproductive. The more you restrict this technology from reaching other countries, the more likely you are to have higher and higher emissions and reach global tipping points much faster. But of course, as I mentioned, that internal change is only one component, then there's the whole cross-border trade angle. And here, the emergence of China is absolutely central, okay? If you look at the period from 2000 onwards, the two decades after that, the manufacturing exports of China more than 10 times increase by value and about 15 times increase by volume. Okay, dramatic increase in Chinese manufacturing exports. And a significant share of that was in the form of imports to the North that required more carbon intensive production. So for example, US imports of just non-electrical machinery and transport equipment from China increased by seven to eight times. By 2015, just China alone accounted for more than half of the carbon emission balance for the USA. Remember, and I told you, USA has the largest carbon, carbon emission uh, balance. That is to say, it is exporting a lot of its carbon emitting consumption, okay? And making other countries produce it. And more than half of that was from China. For Japan, it's even worse, 63%, 49% for Germany, so nearly half, 38% for the UK and so on. It's very clear that this is a process that was driven by the advanced economies and their multinational companies. It really took off after 2002, but it declined in the last decade. You can see clear declines after 2008, not only because of the global financial crisis and its impact, but also because countries were becoming a little bit more aware of this. And what's very interesting is that, that China's trade with developing countries like India, Southeast Asia, and Russia, they show the opposite balance. They actually show that uh, a negative balance of China with these countries. In other words, uh, China is importing from them, from these other developing countries and Russia, uh, more carbon emitting kinds of goods and services. So what does this tell us? Well, you know, first of all, we have to bear in mind that posing the problem as one of, you know, you can choose between poverty reduction, industrialization, development, or you can choose climate mitigation and so on. This is really the wrong way of looking at it. This is not, uh, it's a false dilemma, okay? This is not really the contradiction that matters. It is possible today with available technology, it's restricted, but, we, but humanity has it, okay? It's available. Countries can choose a development pattern that actually reduces uh, carbon emission, even as economies grow. You can improve the level of energy efficiency, as I've suggested. You can change the patterns of investment and consumption towards activities that require less energy. You can become, uh, you know, you can reduce the energy sources you use from petrol and, and uh, coal to natural gas to clean renewables and maybe hydro. Obviously, you have to change urbanization patterns. Okay, uh, it, there's, there's no doubt, this will need more investment. It's not gonna happen on its own. It will need public investment, in fact. But there are plausible estimates. My colleague, Bob Polin, uh, has a book with Noam Chomsky, uh, which lays this out for the general reader, but there are significant studies that show you can do this with 1.5% of GDP of the large economies. So it's not that much. When you think about it, I mean, the US has just spent what? Uh, 14 plus 12 plus 11% of GDP on all these stimulus packages. It's not such a lot of money, okay? But of course, in addition to finance, access to technology is absolutely critical. It's not just that you need the money, but that the developing countries in particular have to be able to access the technologies that allow them to do these investments feasibly. Unfortunately, this is really not possible. The current economic art architecture actually prevents this. And this really has to change. If you want to do anything about global uh, warming, we can't just say, oh, you know, this country has to make this commitment and shame on you if you don't and so on. We have to look at the architecture that is preventing this. So what do we have to do? Well, first of all, when you're determining climate obligations, for heaven's sake, use market exchange rates not this ridiculous PPP exchange rates to determine GDP and therefore climate risk obligations. Bring in the role of historical carbon debt. Consider 
the future carbon budget as well on a per capita basis. Don't just say, I will reduce my get to zero emission by 2050, because in that period, you will continue to hog more than half of the global carbon budget in the US. So that's not good enough. Secondly, we obviously need massive climate finance. And I've argued that you have to do this on global public investment principles. In other words, not as aid, not as charity, not as us rich guys being good to you poor guys who can't do anything for yourselves, not that. As a global public investment to deal with a global challenge, okay? And one possible way of thinking about this is a very dramatic expansion of SDRs, special drawing rights, which are liquidity created by the IMF. Uh, we've seen that last year there was a $650 billion expansion, which is the easiest that the reason it was $650 billion is because that's the amount that you can do uh, in the, uh, the US can agree to without having to go to Congress. And of course, once it goes to Congress, we know that it's dead in the water. It will take five years before any kind of resolution comes. But we could actually think of an annual increase of SDRs of this much because it is effectively free money. It's non-conditional. It goes to every country regardless of you know, anything they do. It enables countries to meet balance of payments problems and gives them a fiscal space to make these required investments. But that's just one of the uh, ways out. We also have to think of regulating and controlling private finance. Why? Because the biggest funders of brown projects are actually global private finance and global private finance based in the North. So, you know, coal investments and everyone's on at China and India, how dare you invest in coal and shame on you and look at the Chinese and the Indians, they're just investing in coal. Well, who are the biggest funders of coal projects globally? Eight out of the 10 funders of global coal are uh, financial companies based in the US, headed by Blackstone. Blackstone alone accounts for 30% of the recent five, last five years investments in new coal projects. So we have to regulate that. We have to say, listen, you cannot be investing now more in the really bad carbon emitting kinds of energy unless you simultaneously expand your investment in green. So supposing you even say that, all right, you desperately have to have some more energy. You need more energy for you to electrify every rural household in India. So you need coal. But the funder of that has to simultaneously fund maybe say three times the amount in renewable energy projects, which are really underfunded. I mean, Africa, there are viable business models that are weeping for new investment of solar energy uh, provision, and they're not getting it. So we say you cannot do this unless you also do that. And these are regulations that are possible. These are not impossible or implausible regulations at all. The uh, sort of the thing, the chosen thing uh, that was much talked about in Glasgow and is unfortunately also popular with some of the Democratic Party in the US is border carbon taxes. That is to say, you say, well, I'm going to tax uh, that I admit that, yes, we're importing stuff that has high carbon content. So to avoid that, I'm going to put a tax on anything that uses high carbon in its production. And that's really good, isn't it? Because look, I'm being all green and I'm being all wonderful. Well, actually, no. In fact, if you're just going to do with that and nothing else, this is actually a trade protectionist device. First of all, the idea of having a global carbon price and a global carbon tax makes sense only if you know that those taxes will be equitably distributed among countries. What's going to happen, we know, is that the US will put a border carbon tax and get all of the tax revenues and not share them with any other country, right? So that's not going to work. And of course, if you're going to have a global carbon tax, you definitely need a global sharing of the revenues with principles that are clear and just and, and fair. But if you do this tax and dividend policy, you need trust. Um, let's face it, G7 does not command much trust in the world today for obvious reasons. And you need international cooperation, which again, I know, don't need to remind you, doesn't really exist. But again, one of the critical things is that we have to share these new technologies. And as we've seen with the COVID vaccine fiasco, that uh, even in a pandemic, even when millions of people die because of it, you will not get either private pharma companies or the government supporting them 
to agree to doing this. But basically, we have to change this intellectual property right regime. We have to renegotiate trips. We have to move out of a system that makes knowledge so inaccessible when it's going to affect all of humanity. Okay, so then finally, let me come back to my question. What is the Asian dilemma then today? Is it really about economic growth and industrialization versus the climate and environment? No, it isn't. It's about how do you carve out an autonomous green economic strategy in an economic system that won't let you do it? When globally, the, everything's sort of stacked against you, when there is a regulatory architecture, a legal architecture that is preventing you from doing the kinds of things that have to be done. So for the dilemma then breaks down into different concerns, I would argue for the developing Asia. First, how do you revive a progressive multilateralism? You have to abandon all of these unjust and counterproductive features that I just talked about. But how do you then revive multilateralism when the response typically is, well, the hell with multilateralism? Will everybody will go their own path? Well, if everyone goes their own path, how much unilateral action can you do? China is in a very different space from the entire rest of the developing world. But even a large country like India can do things that let us say Bangladesh cannot or um, some other country cannot. So we have to consider how much unilateral action is possible. There is, I would argue, significant potential for regional responses. I think the African Union is already showing the way. There is much more regional engagement, especially post pandemic when they've realized that nobody else is going to bother about them. There's much more regional uh, sort of orientation towards regional responses. But in Asia, as I'm sure Firat and Rama will agree, we have so many geopolitical tensions and those really do constrain the capacity for regional response. Then of course, there's the whole problem that our own governments uh, have, there is disproportionate elite control over our own governments. There's a lot of domestic inequality and that is actually actively pushing the other way. So it's one thing to say, I want autonomy to do all these green strategies that can be done. But it's another thing to make sure that your own elite and your own government goes along with it and does that. And that's become an increasing problem. Made worse, I would argue, by the fact that across certainly the Asian region, there is a rise of authoritarianism. And it is increasingly intertwined with the new technologies which enable 24-7, 360 degree surveillance control and manipulation. Now, despite all of this terrible stuff, I do believe that progressive forces can utilize chinks in the armor. I think there are changes everywhere, including in my own country, I hope, which uh, are pushing towards more democratic and more essential responses to dealing with the climate uh, issue and with the other big burning questions of inequality, of disease and so on. But we have to recognize that there is an urgency of the current moment. It's not immediate, it's not going to happen easily. And so it is something that we have to think about as doing um, as soon as possible in any which way. Okay, let me stop here. I'm sorry that I've extended the time a little bit. Uh, not at all. That was uh, fascinating and wonderful. Um, and I mean, the, the, the picture which you gave is one which basically establishes how the problem of carbon emissions is not just is embedded in history, but is inextricably linked to the problem of global inequality. I mean, the same world inequality data best talked about how the top 1% is responsible for 17% of emissions, top 10% is responsible for nearly 50% of emissions and the bottom 50% for 12% of emissions. So there's something and, and um, under, underscoring the role of, you know, the control over patents, the geopolitical arena, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, it could have been depressing except for your <laughs> note of optimism at the end, but one, um, there are a lot of questions, but I want to use my quickly, my, my privilege to just ask one or one or one question because one of the things which is being pushed in a lot of the global talks is these public private partnerships and social development and the SDG uh, kind of in, used in investment 
which has become another route uh, for greenwashing and, uh, you know, it, it both uh, entrenching the inequalities, but also entrenching the climate irresponsibility. So it's not, I mean, it's not just about uh, regulation, but it's also about changing the architecture completely. And the resistance to changing that because the private sector and finance is not going to do it. Yes. So, I mean, what, um, any quick responses on that? Yeah. You know, you're absolutely right, Rama. I mean, this whole pri public-private partnership so far has been a means of risk reduction for the private sector, where basically the public sector comes and underwrites all the risks, yeah. and then they just get the money for grabs. The way in which they, and this need not happen, by the way, that's the whole point, that this is all not essential and necessary. It is in the design of those partnerships. So one of the classic examples is actually right here in the US when Elon Musk and the electric vehicle, okay? So the government of the US, the federal government gets into an agreement with Musk that yes, we will fund 75% of your venture and the rest you can borrow because if the US government is funding 75%, obviously banks will lend to you. If it works, we will step back. Mm. If it doesn't work, it's okay. We have taken it over. We will cover your risk. What? Can you exactly. imagine any venture capitalist doing that? Why do they, won't they say, well, we've got 75% equity, at least at the very minimum. Why is this man the richest man in the world? Because the government of the US has basically handed him this thing. And so, you know, and then he is celebrated as this great revolutionary who is making electric cars. So I think it's in the design of these PPPs and they need not be like that. They have to put in conditions. If the government in the US is giving six, you know, $2 billion to Moderna to develop a vaccine, it has to say, well, you bloody well share the technology after you've made it. Instead of which it says, oh yes, please take the patent and please do what you like with it. And oh yes, we will pay for the, for the uh, vaccines you produce and we will pay extra for the booster doses you produce. What is this nonsense? Yeah. So I think there is, it's really, this is nothing but the reflection of the political lobbying power of big companies. And they get away with it because we, the public, allow them to. So I think it's not yeah. just that PPPs are a big con, but that not enough people realize what a big con they are. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So kind of relating to that, uh, to the question of uh, the, how the public reacts. There are two questions which I'll kind of <laughs> give you at the same time. Uh, one is asking about the agents of change that can bring about the agenda you suggest, uh, including, oh, I mean, what are the most productive pushback taking place and how can it be best supported? And second, there's a question about representation. In the past, you had the non-aligned movement speaking for the global south. Today, there's a discussion, I mean, in the discussion about industrialization versus climate responsibility. It involves big players, in, even in the South, but, but there is the geopolitics. So, uh, and a lot of global South, which is outside that discussion completely. I mean, so China and India are powerful, but who speaks to the rest of the South? Yeah. So, yeah. No, I mean, these are all essential and very, very important questions. And I, it's true. I should have talked a, a lot more about the smaller countries of the South who are also, in fact, let's admit it, uh, suppressed, oppressed by the regional bullies and by the, the Southern large countries that uh, also seek to maximize their gains. So let me begin with this whole issue about the current geopolitics and how do we speak for the rest of the South? And I do believe that one of the biggest challenges today is just getting a minimal degree of unity. You know, that is to say, it has become a South that has been so divided, so, you know, separated by so many different issues that on any international forum, we don't work together. We don't actually present a common front. And I, I, it can be from the whole tax discussion in the OECD where, you know, most of the African countries didn't even attend the meetings to uh, any of the, you know, the IMF uh, kinds of meetings where, if they all stood up and made a sufficient noise, there would be a reaction to the WTO, which is supposedly based on one country, one vote, which ends up you know, basically still pushing the agenda of the North. So we're not getting enough unity among the developing South. One of the reasons I'm hopeful is because in the last year, and again, for the wrong reasons, because the pandemic 
really kind of exposed how cynical the North is, how G7 really just does not care. And as a result, we have seen more move towards slightly more regional. Definitely in Africa, there are so many regional initiatives. It's really quite exciting now to see what's going on in Africa. The slightly pinkish wave once again coming in Latin America, where they're again conscious of this need for a regional position on many things. And well, I know <laughs> Asia doesn't look so thrilling at this moment, but you know, I, I do believe um, having been around waiting for change in many ways in many over many decades, that change doesn't come necessarily from the directions you're expecting it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that a large part of our subcontinent for sure is really ripe for change. It, it looks very depressing in, in India at the moment, but I don't think it is completely depressing. I think there are things going on which possibly could bubble up into something much more. So for the rest of the South, for the smaller countries, I, I would emphasize really the importance of coalitions. It's You cannot do this on your own. There's no way a Mia Motley in Barbados will be able to influence global policy, no matter how powerful her speech. It, you know, they will have to get together with other countries and, and have a joint position that makes it harder. What's the most productive pushback? Well, there are so many, but I think if I had to identify two, it would be regulation of finance and control over knowledge. These mm-hmm. are the two, to me, the two absolutely critical areas. If we don't break those down, nothing else is going to follow. And uh, in that sense, therefore, who are the agents of change? Okay, now this I'm saying because now we're all in the US, right? And I've been in the US for a year. I have to confess, I am stunned at the lack of knowledge. I mean, I'm in a very progressive university in a very progressive part of the country. Everybody is green, everybody recycles, everybody does all the right things. Yet nobody knows about a lot of these basic things. Nobody knows about even the whole vaccine inequity. Nobody knows about... Minimal things are people are not aware. So I think a big job would be if you sufficiently raised awareness in the global north, then the governments wouldn't be able to get away with as much as they are getting away with. Okay. Um, uh, Eddie, thoughts on the uh, Green New Deal? Uh, uh, where basically, uh, I mean, the idea that one can consume ourselves out of climate change using greener energy, is that really possible without reducing consumption in the North, especially by those in the top 10% of the income distribution? Also considering that electric cars, wind turbines, batteries, et cetera, highly resource intensive, resor- resources can come uh, in the poorest countries at a very high environmental cost. So, anyway. You know, these are excellent, excellent questions. And in fact, um, I'm working on a paper right now on the uh-huh. environmental impacts of all the so-called good mitigation strategies in the North, you know, the electric batteries, the lithium, the recycling, which is mostly exported to the poorer countries and done in terrible environmental conditions and so on. So, yeah, I, I completely take that point and not only take, I mean, I think that's an urgent area, again, of much greater awareness where you have to think about the full implications, because again, remember, it's not necessary. Yes, we need lithium. It doesn't mean that it has to be extracted in the worst possible way, in the cheapest possible way, with the greatest displacement of the local population, with the least regard for the rights of nature or the rights of the local people. But that is how it's being done because there's no attention to it. And because even the person who buys the electric car in the US doesn't really stop to ask, well, is it being done in the best possible way? It's not an issue. So I think, yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. Can you do a global new deal? I'm a big supporter. Uh, I am a complete 100% supporter of a global green new deal. I call it a multicolored new deal because I think green is not good enough. I think it has to also be blue for water. I think it has to be purple for the care economy. And Nama, you will know exactly (laughs) about all of the concerns about inadequate investment in care. I think it has to be red because it has to be redistributive fundamentally and deeply. So I think it has to be a multicolored global new deal. Is it possible? In principle, yes. Geopolitically at the moment, it's not. But that means you have to change the, the politics, right? That, in other words, it's not something which is innately impossible, but it is something which currently the politics renders impossible. The critics of it from the left, or if you like, from the degrowth 
kind of perspective. My friend Jason Hickel and others would argue that, well, listen, you're still talking about growing. Why are you even talking about growing? And I, I have to confess that I find the fight between the degrowthers and the green growthers to be a bit um, barking up the wrong tree. Because when you look at the policy recommendations of both, they're identical. Everybody is talking about reducing the consumption of the top 10%. Everybody is talking about redistribution and about better ways of living, of organizing your cities, of organizing production, of distribution, et cetera, et cetera, okay? They're all making very, very similar points in terms of what you need to do. So, and both sides agree completely that GDP is a terrible measure. It doesn't measure human progress. It doesn't capture prosperity, et cetera. It's a very bad measure for many, many reasons. It uh, uh, rewards death. I mean, you know, wars or instruments of mass destruction like the US is spending, uh, et cetera. All of this create more GDP, unpaid care work, no GDP, therefore not relevant. Not So many, many problems with it. Um, if it has so many problems, why are we obsessing about whether it should grow off or fall? It's not relevant. So mm -hmm. my point is, degrowthers, green growthers, forget that. Get on with arguing for the policies that we want. <laughs> Which brings me to another question. Is how has a talk, if you've given this talk, or your, or your arguments been received by the zero growth advocates? So as I said, I have friends uh, on both sides, very close friends yeah. on both sides. Yeah. So and I, I have precisely this, I mean, they will, uh, Tim Jackson agrees with everything I say. Thanks. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So Jason and Tim, they're fine with what I say because of the conclusions being the same. If I said, but we have to have this much GDP growth, then they would get hysterical. I don't yeah. say that because I don't believe it. Okay. Sure. Similarly, Bob Polin and others agree with everything I say, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because, in fact, they have exactly the same arguments and policy conclusions. If I had said this necessarily requires a negative rate of growth, then they would be on my case. But I don't say that because to me, it's not relevant. Another false dilemma. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, there's one, uh, one question. Um, uh, so in, your in the calculations you presented, does it take into account the impact on militaries, especially when calculating carbon emissions? by class, how are militaries taken into account and are they included? Um, and is the military included? In, uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, are they assigned in, 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 in groups, lower, middle, upper class in terms of share? And does one consider responsibility when taking into account the presence of military bases? Okay, so countries? this is a very interesting question. The military uh, enters into production, okay? So armaments production would be one aspect of the military. And the military enters into services, the armed forces, and you know all of the all of that would be part of the services. So they enter GDP, all right. Yeah. So in terms of the denominator, it's all it's there in the GDP. Um, does can we measure the emissions of the military separately on the basis of current data? No, not that I have seen. We don't have the kind of disaggregate data that says, you know, this is the kind of spending emissions by the military. We we cannot do that for any country that I know of. Does this include emissions in military bases? Well, yeah, except that it would be assigned to that country. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the Philippines would have higher emissions because of the military bases of the US in the Philippines or wherever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so we, uh, we had an earlier time, but there's one question, so let's... Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. Um, so can, uh, can you talk about whether the environmental movements in India are comparable to the US? Are their priorities different or the same? Do they take into account some of the issues you discussed about climate inequality within country, within country climate inequality? So let me be honest, I don't know enough about the environmental movement in the US, so I can't really compare. I can tell you a little bit about the environmental movement in India, in which most of the uh, environmentalists are not middle class. I mean, they're middle class, but their focus is much more on the poor. And so it's, they are very conscious of the need for, you know, local uh, indigenous people in certain very backward, so-called backward, undeveloped regions, their need for basic goods and services and so on. They're very conscious of the extractive, exploitative and displacing nature of a lot of projects. So they began with opposition to coal well be before 
coal became a bad thing because of climate change. Coal was terrible because it was not just extractive and displacing of local populations, but it's hugely polluting. I mean, you grow up in a coal, uh, coal uh, mining area, you basically have a lung problem for the rest of your life. And so uh, the environmental movement in India is very, very conscious, I think, of the needs of the poor and of the larger population. I, I confess I don't know enough about the environmental movement in the US, but it does strike me that it's much more limited to what are often slightly more symbolic expressions of concern, you know? Okay. <laughs> like the whole recycling thing, mm -hmm. where, you know, even my colleagues didn't know that 80% of US waste is uh, traded. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it lands up in yeah. <laughs> developing countries. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't think there are any more questions, and we are kind of out of time, but. Thank you so much. It was really stimulating and fun as always. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah.